Good evening. The Hong Kong government has issued a red travel alert for Vietnam, warning people against going there as anti-Chinese violence spreads across the country. At least 20 people, including Chinese nationals, have been reported killed in riots and hundreds of Chinese have fled the country. Blood has been spilled as violent anti-China protests in Vietnam spread from the south to the center and north of the country. More than 20 people were killed when rioters attacked a steel mill under construction in the central province of Ha Tin. 16 people said to be Chinese and five Vietnamese workers were killed, according to a doctor in Ha Tin, 300 kilometers south of the capital Hanoi. He said 100 people were taken to the hospital after an orgy of arson and looting at the plant. Although the protesters are furious with China, the steel plant, which will be the biggest in Southeast Asia when it's completed in 2020, belongs to a Taiwanese firm. The company said in Taipei that one Chinese worker was killed and 90 were injured. Vietnamese media reports mentioned only one fatality. Also in Ha Tin, a manager said 10 Chinese nationals were missing and 55 workers injured after demonstrators attacked four Chinese factories. China's official Sinhua News Agency reported that at least two Chinese nationals were dead and more than 100 in hospital. Chinese-owned businesses in the northern Vietnamese port city of Haiphong were also targeted in the worst anti-Beijing violence since the two neighbors clashed along their border 35 years ago. The turmoil began in the south earlier this week when thousands of citizens vented their anger at China after it moved an oil rig into disputed waters close to the Vietnamese coast. Almost 500 foreign-owned factories and offices in Binh Duong and Dong Nai provinces were attacked, with at least 15 badly damaged in arson attacks. About 600 protesters were arrested yesterday, and today Beijing expressed serious concern, demanding that Hanoi crack down hard on the rioters that the Vietnamese government has described as vandals and hooligans. Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Hua Chan Ying urged Hanoi to protect Chinese nationals and pay compensation for the damage and casualties. In the midst of the violence, hundreds of Chinese nationals have been fleeing Vietnam. At least 600 crossed the border into Cambodia, while many flew out. Vietnamese Prime Minister Nguyen Tan Dong has ordered the police to protect foreigners and their property. He also vowed swift action to stop the violence and warned those involved that they face stiff punishment. Even as tensions remained high on land, there was more friction at sea. Coast Guard vessels from the two nations played a cat and mouse game as Chinese boats tried to keep Vietnamese ships from the controversial rig. Local news now. Financial Secretary John Zhang is taking contingency measures to keep public services running while radical lawmakers delay the budget bill with the filibuster. Zhang warned there won't be enough money to pay government salaries next month. ATV's Emily Su reports. After an emergency meeting with 150 department heads and representatives this morning, Financial Secretary John Zhang announced contingency measures to keep public services running. Zhang said the government would temporarily withhold funding for higher education institutions, the hospital authority and the LegCo Commission in June to free up $5.1 billion. The money will be diverted to other public services and departments that will soon run out of funds because of the filibuster by radical lawmakers blocking the passage of the budget bill, he explained. But Zhang stressed the amount is not enough to sustain government operations for a week. The financial chief dismissed allegations that he's deliberately causing public alarm to pressure LegCo President Zhang yuk sing to kill the filibuster. This is not small, uh, scaremongering at all. Uh, what we are doing is to present the facts and I think we as the, the central government here deal with our, our colleagues uh, in the different departments to let them know what the situation is uh, so, so that they would, they would uh, work with us uh, in, in, in terms of uh, make, making the, what the remaining resources, uh, make, make them last as long as, as, as they can. Zhang repeated his warning that the $78 billion of interim funding the government secured two months ago will run out in a fortnight. By that time, the funds of more than 60 government departments will dry up, compromising the public services they provide. Zhang rejected claims by the filibustering lawmakers that the debate can be finished by the end of this month if their pro-government colleagues turned up dutifully to meet core rules. If indeed, if the, uh, uh, if the filibustering 
can be completed by the end of the month uh, is, is good uh, because the, the, ideal, the ideal time has, has, has already passed, but the, the sooner uh, they can finish the, the filibustering, the better. But the LegCo president is more optimistic than the financial secretary about finishing up by the end of this month. Uh, so uh, we are working, we are working uh, towards this target date. I hope that we can uh, dispose of the um, uh, bill before the first meeting of the council in June. Uh, that will minimize uh, any possible uh, difficulty caused. Inside the LegCo chamber this morning, lawmakers continue to sift through a record 1,192 amendments tabled by the radicals to stall the budget. Their delaying tactic forced the legislature to spend over 30 hours in the past fortnight to go through about a fifth of the amendments. Speaking during one of the many quorum calls they initiated, People Power's Albert Chan and Raymond Chan and Hugh Stung are faking the fiscal cliff that he has repeatedly warned about. Albert Chan said the government has a lot of money, but the finance minister does not know how to distribute it properly. Chang questioned why Zhang did not simply request another round of temporary funding or extend the first round by another month to avoid the fiscal cliff in June. The finance chief dismissed that suggestion, saying it would only prolong the filibuster. He also rejected calls to meet the radicals, saying he remains opposed to the demands for universal retirement protection and a $10,000 cash handout for all permanent residents. The government has decided to scrap a key pan-democratic proposal for universal suffrage when it launches the second round of public consultation. Opposition lawmakers are shocked at the move. Here's Emily Su. The three ministers spearheading the government's public consultation on political reform dealt a major blow to the pan-democratic camp during an off-camera media luncheon today. Chief Secretary Carrie Lam and Constitutional Affairs Minister Raymond Tam said a three-track proposal from the Alliance for Truth and Democracy will not be included in the next round of public consultation. They insisted that allowing ordinary voters and political parties to join the official nominating committee in naming chief executive candidates for the 2017 election is legally disputable, difficult to reach a political consensus on and hard to implement. Tam said as such, it's unlikely that the alliance's plan will be included in the second round of consultation, in which the government is expected to roll out a revised electoral reform blueprint for discussion. Just as Chief Rimsky Yun urged people not to advocate proposals that are clearly unconstitutional. Democratic Party Chairwoman Emily Lau expressed shock at the government's decision. She said although she accepts their view that civil and political party nomination is disputable, many international legal experts think otherwise. Lau urged the government to be fair and transparent instead of ruling out a plan without a proper explanation. Frederick Fung from the ADPL said he's not too worried, as none of the three ministers has the authority to make the final decision on political reform. Tam said during the next round of consultation, the government will provide the public with options on several key points, such as whether to expand the nomination committee from the existing 1,200 members to 1,600. He said anything not mentioned today can be studied further, giving hope to a moderate proposal by 18 scholars to let ordinary voters recommend and not directly nominate candidates for the city's top job. This prompted the Civic Party's Ronnie Tong to urge the authorities to clarify if that means there's a chance the government will accept other moderate plans, such as his own and that of former Chief Secretary Anson Chan. Tong said if they remain silent, it may give people the idea that there's no hope for genuine universal suffrage. By rejecting the three-track proposal, the government has not only killed the key platform in the pan-democratic camp's fight for universal suffrage, but also rendered the Occupy Central Movement's de facto referendum meaningless next month. Last Tuesday, more than 2,500 Occupy Central supporters chose three proposals that will be put to the vote on the 22nd of June, with the movement going on to champion the winning plan. But all three contain elements of civil nomination. 
The Pan-Democrats' three-track proposal was regarded as the least radical of the three. Today, Lam said those taking part in the Occupy Central referendum should consider whether that poll provides them with a genuine choice. Hong Kong today burned the first batch of its massive stockpile of confiscated ivory to show the world it's serious about protecting elephants. But the Environment Minister dismissed calls for a total ban on ivory sales. ATV's Britain Planet reports. These cylinders, containing the first batch of the city's huge stockpile of confiscated ivory, were destined for the furnace at the Chemical Waste Treatment Centre in Qingyi today. One tonne of cubed ivory pieces were placed in a rotary kiln where it was reduced to black soot. Hong Kong has confiscated 30 tonnes of elephant tusks seized over the years in a crackdown on smuggling. Two tonnes have been reserved for scientific and educational purposes, while the remainder will be incinerated over two years. Hong Kong has been under pressure to destroy its stockpile after China set the example by burning six tonnes earlier this year in a spectacular ceremony. But the city's ivory destruction was low-key today, with officials kicking off the event with a mock burning. Environment Secretary Wong Kam Singh said he hopes the move, long demanded by conservation and animal welfare groups, will deliver a powerful message. We do care about the conservation of elephants, and um, this time uh, the incineration of the confiscated ivory uh, demonstrate that uh, a very key message to the community locally and internationally that we are having the determination uh, to uh, face this challenge. The government is destroying its massive haul of seized elephant tusks to show that it's determined to help stamp out the illegal ivory trade. But critics want the authorities to go further and ban the sale of ivory products in Hong Kong altogether. A worldwide ban on the ivory trade was introduced in 1989, but local retailers with a special license can sell items made from approved government stockpiles. The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES, doesn't require governments to close their local markets. Instead, Wong said steps will be taken to create more awareness of the effects of ivory sales. We would uh, uh, step up our public education and publicity about these aspects. But I think the point is that uh, we would like to strictly follow the CITES requirement. Uh, and I think the current uh, arrangement uh, is comparable to other overseas practice. CITES Secretary General John Scanlon encouraged the government to make sure no new ivory tusks are circulated in the market. But it is basically a decision for the government of Hong Kong SAR. Our convention does not oblige a domestic market to be closed, but it does oblige very strict regulation. Hong Kong is an entry hub for the illegal trade in elephant tusks from Africa to the mainland. Eight tons were seized by customs officials in the city last year alone. Britain Clinic, ATV News. The Consumer Council has sounded a health warning after finding there is too much caffeine and sugar in common sports and energy drinks on the market. ATV's Winner Wong reports. There's no shortage of sports and energy drinks on the market. But just how effective are they? After testing 19 brands, the Consumer Council has found there's too much sugar and caffeine in them. The caffeine content is certainly not satisfactory to uh, young children. The watchdog warned that children and those considered vulnerable, such as pregnant women, could suffer from irregular heartbeat and seizures if they have too much caffeine. Two of the products tested, Coca-Cola Relentless Energy Drink and Monster Energy Carbonated Energy Beverage, were found to contain 50.5 and 52.5 grams of sugar, equivalent to 10 or 11 cubes of sugar. This is well above levels recommended by the World Health Organization, which says an adult should not consume more than 50 grams of sugar a day. While the watchdog does not plan to take any action for now, it warned consumers to be aware of the effects of sports drinks. They have to understand about you know, the impact of um, caffeine on you uh, during that short period and also uh, whether it will form to become a pattern for you to, um, we I, will, I won't use you know, the word addict, you know, but you just keep on using it. You know, is it the, the, the right form for you? That will be something you know, that the consumer has to think about. 
Sports drinks are gaining popularity, but the Consumer Council says they're not really needed after a strenuous workout. The best and the cheapest way is to rehydrate by drinking lots of water. With summer upon us, the council also checked 15 air conditioners and 10 electric fans to measure their cooling capacities and energy efficiency. All air conditioners tested qualified for the top grade of the energy efficiency labeling scheme. But the watchdog noted that the gadgets still have an energy efficiency difference of as much as 7.6 percent. The council said electric fans are an ideal alternative to beat the summer heat as they are cheaper to operate and much more environmentally friendly. Wen Wang, ATV News. Thailand is bracing for more trouble after three anti-government protesters were killed in a gun and grenade attack in the capital, Bangkok. Opposition activists today forced the acting prime minister to abandon talks on free, fresh elections. Riot police stood guard outside the entrance of an Air Force school where the interim government was meeting the election commission this morning to set the date for fresh polls. But anti-government protesters got word of the talks and headed to the venue in northern Bangkok. They managed to slip past the police and dash into the compound. The intrusion forced acting Prime Minister Niwat Thamrong Bunsong Paisan to abandon the meeting, and new polls tentatively set for the 20th of July may have to be pushed further back. Thailand has to go to the polls again after a top court ousted his predecessor Yin Lakshinawat last week for abuse of power. The police, meanwhile, have been searching for clues following a deadly assault on anti-government demonstrators in the early hours of this morning. Witnesses said a small group of men raided a protest camp at the Democracy Monument in the capital. Grenades were thrown before the attackers opened fire, killing three people and wounding about 20. No group has claimed responsibility for the carnage, one of the worst since November when tens of thousands of people poured into the streets of Bangkok at the start of a campaign to depose Yin Lak. She was accused of being a puppet of her brother, former Premier Taksin, who fled Thailand to avoid a jail term for corruption. But Yin Lak defied the protests until she was ordered to quit by the Constitutional Court, paving the way for party colleague Niwat Tamrong to take over. The opposition, which wants to end the Shinawat family's influence on Thai politics, is demanding that the Senate appoint a neutral prime minister by tomorrow. Protest leader Sutap Taksuban warned that the people may have to seize power if the senators fail to act. But a government supporter cautioned if that happens, pro yinok activists will wrest back power. As chaos and fear take hold in Thailand, many are wondering if and when the military will intervene to end a long-running crisis that is dividing the nation. Finance news, Hong Kong stocks have climbed to the highest close in nearly a month, lifted by tech giant Tencent Holdings. The Hansen Index gained 0.7% or 148 points to finish at 22,730 on turnover of $54.8 billion. The index got a boost from Tencent posting better than expected first quarter results. Let's take a look at markets overseas starting in the U.S. Sharp losses on Wall Street. The Dow Jones is down 174 points. In Europe, London FTSE is down 45 points. The Frankfurt DAX is down 94 points. The Paris CAC is down 49 points. U.S. dollar cross rates the euro 1.37. The pound is 1.68. It's 101.4 Japanese yen against the U.S. dollar. Time to check your Mark 6 tickets. Tonight's winning numbers 9, 12, 16, 24, 34, 35. The extra number is 7. The weather forecast for the next few days mainly cloudy with a few showers tomorrow and temperatures ranging from 27 to 30 degrees. Sunny intervals with a few showers over the weekend, followed by cloudy conditions with rain next week. Here's a look at the weather around the world.
that's all the news for now. Thanks for watching ATV. I'm Edna Dare. Good night. Coming up, a window on. Mr. Asia Craves, rocking the world. ATV Mr. Asia Contest 2014 is now open for online application. She's the highest in the tropics. Standing quietly, she presents a peaceful picture. But coming close to her turns out to be a heavy task. Terrible weather adds more hardship. Explore the unexpected. Every step of the journey matters. Documentary World, The Great Summits, tomorrow night at 9. In cooking, there are rules. In Aaron Craze's world, rules are made to be broken. This is what's different to fine dining any sort of food. Believe it or not, the best delicacies are on the street. That's fantastic, look at that. Gear up for the amazing cooking tour. Rude Boy Food. Friday night at 10. This is the same thing. It's the same thing. But it's not. This is the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. But it's not. Look for the No Fakes Pledge sign. It means that the retailer has promised to sell only genuine goods and you can shop there with peace of mind. Let's support the No Fakes Pledge scheme. 呢度有齐晒我想买嘅嘢啊！我哋呢度仲有正版正货承诺标志添。They can drive you nuts. From the most powerful roaring on earth to the sexiest bodies you'll ever see. They're surely every man's dream. Drive it every Monday night at eight. When you search online for a hotel room, you get so many results. But when you look closely, you find the same hotel room on the same date for different prices. Trivago instantly compares over 150 websites to find your ideal hotel for the best price. Hotel Trivago. A Russian city is celebrating its comeback. It may be a Soviet cannon that's used to fire the midday salute, but when they hear it, the inhabitants of St. Petersburg think primarily of Tsar Peter the Great. He introduced the cannon shot in the early 18th century to enable people in his new capital to keep track of the time. The bombardier is instructing a young graduate of the military academy. Being allowed to fire the 12 o'clock shot is seen as a special honour. On this particular occasion, there are even several high-ranking officers in attendance. A regular midday salute for a proud city. That doesn't even happen in Moscow. Look at Petersburg and smile, the bombardier tells the young officer. The young officer receives the shell casing as a trophy and warm congratulations from the general. Since the end of the Soviet era, St. Petersburg has re-established its ties with the past, reflecting on the time when it was the capital of Imperial Russia, yet at the same time seeking to catch up with the present. St. Petersburg wants to be both old and really young, and 
to forget the Soviet era. Maria Gagarina and her daughter Vaya come from an old St. Petersburg family of aristocrats. Vaya will soon be attending her first aristocratic ball and is desperate for a new dress. Does it have to meet certain requirements? Probably, but I've no idea what. Vaya was born just after the collapse of the Soviet Union. For many years before then, by and large, the nobility had kept their origins a secret. Disclosure of their aristocratic status, they feared, might cause them problems. Then, several years ago, Vaya's grandfather re-established the St. Petersburg aristocratic salon. The whole nobility issue meant a great deal to my parents, but I was never really interested. In fact, I looked upon it almost with a touch of contempt. My view today, though, is that if it was so important to my parents, then perhaps we should re-establish this tradition. That's why Vaya and I want to at least take a look at an aristocratic ball. <laughs> First, though, the two still have to find the right dress. Elsewhere, too, preparations for the ball are in full swing. At the Perch Private Grammar School in the centre of St. Petersburg, dance instructor Irina Sergeyeva is practising aristocratic posture and etiquette with her pupils. She attaches...